Hi everyone. Um, so I'm from the GovTech Singapore. Uh, our mission is to um, engineer digital government and make lives better. Um, so today I'll be sharing on open attestation. Uh, this is an open source document endorsement and verification framework using the blockchain. So I know I'm the only thing standing in between you and uh, probably your post-conference drinks or dinner. So I'm just going to um, get straight into the meat of it. Um, I'll just say that I think in the public consciousness and we hear about the term blockchain, most people think about cryptocurrency and we've definitely heard um, a very fascinating presentation earlier um, on, crypto or on Bitcoin ordinals. Uh, I'll just say that for open attestation, what we're interested is in is how the key attributes of blockchain can be applied to document endorsement and verification. Uh, at the same time, um, there are certain limitations of the, of the technology, um, but we think that the way that we're designing open attestation can help us to um, either get around this um, or to basically make it um, less of uh, an issue, I think, for how we are um, uh, using blockchain for open attestation. So I'm just going to get into how it works. So for open attestation, what this is, is an open source framework to endorse and to verify documents. We have two key components. Um, the first, we look at verifiable documents. So um, these are temper evident documents that cryptographically prove the authenticity, the source of the document. So you can think of credentials like academic qualifications, um, proof of identity, proof of employment, etc. We also look at transferable records, similar to verifiable documents, but these are documents that can have an owner. Um, usually such documents confer ownership of assets. Um, so we are looking at documents like title deeds or a bill of lading. Um, what I think is interesting about open attestation, we, it allows for uh, decentralized issuance of credentials. Um, and I think we really do believe in um, the power of open source um, software. Um, and that's why all of our code is open source. Um, so the verification can, of course, be distributed. Anyone can set up a verifier uh, based on our technology. Um, but depending on the use case, we can also uh, um, centralize the uh, verification process um, in terms of directing people to um, a particular verifier. And that's just for um, perhaps a better user experience or um, for certain government use cases, um, just for better um, public comms um, uh, in terms of how to use um, the documents. So earlier I mentioned that a double-edged sword or, or, or like one of the, the I guess, points of, of uh, blockchain is that the data, data stored is public, right? So you may be thinking, hey, you know, some of these credentials are um, confidential, it may be personal, so we, should we really be putting that on a blockchain? Um, so what we are doing in open, access, in open attestation um, is to design in a way that upholds data privacy because we're only publishing a document hash on the blockchain, but not the data itself. So I'm going to get into basically how we are um, doing the verification. And this is essentially premised on three critical steps. So when we look at the verification tech, um, which is the core of uh, open attestation, um, we are trying to um, provide three critical steps. So the first one is to verify that the document has not been tampered with and that it has been issued by the issuer. We want to verify that the document has not been revoked and we also want to confirm the identity of the issuer. So how does this work? When we issue an open attestation document, um, we first take the raw document um, in JSON format and we put it through a process that we call wrapping. So the end product of this wrapping process is a unique hash that represents the document. And of course, if the document is tampered with, then it will not be possible to derive the same hash and we can prove that it has been tampered with. So the flow is um, pretty simple. Um, for each property, we salt to uh, prevent rainbow table attacks. Um, we then flatten and encode the properties as a string. Um, each field is hashed with the value in salt. Um, and then we store all the output hashes in an array. Um, finally, um, we hash the array of hashes to produce a target hash. So um, I think to, to put it simply, it would be a hash of hashes. What this allows us to do is also to perform selective reduction, uh, selective redaction on the document. 
So if we want to, say, uh, redact a particular field of the credential, for example, it's not necessary to disclose this, right? And people would naturally want to minimize what they're sharing. Um, then it's possible to redact the, the particular document property um, by removing it from your credential and storing the hash um, under a different uh, field that we call obfuscated data. However, this still does not invalidate the target hash um, because it, it doesn't invalidate the target hash of the document because we are computing the target hash out of all, using all of the hashes that have been stored um, in the open attestation document, including those that were moved to obfuscated data. So after performing the wrapping, func uh, the wrapping process, uh, this is an example of how it will look like. Um, so you, as you can see, the document properties have been sorted, and we now have a target hash that represents our document. Okay, so now we have uh, found a way to wrap the document. Um, next, we need to verify that the document was issued uh, by the issuer. Uh, we have two ways of doing that. So the first one would be via um, a smart contract. Um, the issuer basically deploys a smart contract that acts as a, what we call a document store. This keeps a record of the issued documents, the issued hashes um, of the documents. Um, but do note that this involves an on-chain transaction and does consume gas, but we'll come back to this later. So this allows anyone to check if a hash, uh, which, rec which represents a document, has been issued. And then when we are doing the, during the verification process, what we are doing is to first check that the target hash of the document uh, is in the document store's list of issued hashes. And we are also checking that it has not been revoked, that it is not in the list of revoked hashes. So um, I would say this, is, this was probably the first iteration or the first version uh, of open attestation. Um, Another newer method that we developed would be to use decentralized identifiers um, to issue documents. And currently we're using DID Ethereum. So when we, after signing the open attestation document, um, basically it would contain the issuer's DID and the signed target hash. Then when we are doing the verification process, um, what we do is to compare the Ethereum address from the DID document with the address that is returned by verification. Uh, if it matches, we know that the signature is valid, the document has been issued, and that it has not been tampered with. Okay, so um, earlier I did mention that um, issuance is, uh, uh, does consume gas, um, and this can potentially be an issue for users if you're issuing documents one by one and you have um, many... Um, documents to issue. So um, what we also develop is to allow issuers to batch transactions uh, using Merkle trees. So each document target hash is a leaf in the Merkle tree and we compute the Merkle root, uh, which is then stored in the open attestation document um, along with the proofs needed to ensure that this um, document is part of this Merkle tree. Uh, of course, for a single document, um, that, that doesn't need to be batched, then the target hash and the Merkle root are the same. All right, um, the, final, um, the final area that we, uh, the final area of, or step of verification uh, would be on the issuer identity. Um, this is an, I guess it's still an area that we are still working on and developing. Currently, we leverage on um, the domain name system. We use the DNS text records to publish the document store address or the DID. Um, and then this is then checked against so that we know that the credential is issued by the entity that controls this domain. Okay, um, so now I'm going to get into the perhaps more exciting part of my presentation, which is to talk about the products that are currently powered by Open Attestation. And this is by no means um, an exhaustive list, and we are always looking out for more ways that the Open Attestation can be applied. Um, and so that's partially why we are here today at FOSS, um, at FOSS Asia. I'm really uh, interested to hear if there's any ideas for how this technology could be um, applied. 
So the first one I will talk about is called Open, open Certs. Um, basically, it started as a proof of concept to um, improve productivity. Um, basically, schools were spending a lot of time and effort on verification of, of um, the certificates. So you would have um, people, um, maybe employers, who want to confirm that the graduates' paper certificates were legitimate. So they might say, call up the school and ask the school to check and verify. Um, schools were also spending time on replacement of lost certificates. Um, so this was consuming, I think, up to at least seven men months uh, in, in a year. Um, so with um, open attestation, which powers open certs, um, so graduates from Singapore Institutes of Higher Learning um, can receive their degrees or certs in the form of an open attestation document. And then these can be easily verified by uh, employers on the opencerts.io uh, verifier. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we are able to open the link here or whether I'm able to uh, switch out to a browser. Oh, great. Fantastic. Yep. Um, so this is the open certs verifier. Um, so if we look at the demo, um, this, is how the, this is how the user um, would go through it. They would, um, you can just easily drag and drop your cert into the verifier. Um, this will load up our decentralized renderer. It will render the cert, for example, um, we have this demo. And um, there can be multiple views uh, of the same um, open attestation document. Um, another thing is, um, earlier I mentioned that we um, allow for selective redaction of credentials. So for example, um, we are able to say redact um, certain info that's not um, required. So for example, if you're only focusing on the CS um, course, on the CS courses and the um, grades, um, you can redact um, let me grab this. So you can redact um, the details um, and download the file, um, but it will still remain verifiable. Yep. And then um, you're able to download it. And if I try to verify it again, um, Maybe a bit. Oh, downloads. I see it. Thanks. Yep. So if we um, if we verify it again, you can see that the redacted fields um, have now been removed. Um, but we also do um, mention that um, it has been redacted, just not what was redacted. Um, and earlier, when we were going through the verification steps, um, this is how um, we would provide the assurance um, to verifiers uh, in terms of it has not been tampered with, it has not been revoked, and it is issued by, say, um, uh, this particular entity, in this case, GovTech. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's one of the, I think, first use cases of open attestation. The next one is a bit more recent. So um, if I'm just going to toggle back to, uh, sorry. Um, and click here. OK. Yeah, so this is uh, probably a bit more recent. Um, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it was really important to be able to um, prove um, that your know, vaccine certs and uh, test results um, were legitimate. Um, also to eliminate the existence of fake COVID-19 test results um, and also to support the opening of borders and resumption of life as normal. Um, so given the decentralized nature of the issuance, and the need for um, a way to attest to the documents in a cross-border way. Um, so open attestation was uh, adopted as a solution. 
and this powers the health certs um, that basically Singapore, uh, Singaporeans use to prove that um, they have been uh, vaccinated, for example, or that they have passed like their pre-departure COVID tests. So um, users could go to this uh, notarized platform to apply for a notarized health cert for travel. Um, and then cross-border, immigration authorities could easily scan the QR code of a health cert to verify it. Um, so I'm sharing this example because I think it also shows the strength of the free and open source movement. Um, because um, OA was open source, because it had been used um, for other applications, there were providers out there um, that were able to help uh, perhaps less tech-savvy uh, medical clinics to onboard the health search solution um, and for them to quickly issue um, vaccine certs in the open attestation format. So um, we were able to adopt this uh, solution um, quite quickly um, and um, in, I guess in a, in a scalable way. And the last uh, use case that I am excited to share about is called Trade Trust. Um, so I'm the product manager for Trade Trust. We are uh, basically looking to accelerate the transformation um, from paper-based trade documents to digital documents. Um, when we look at the current state of cross-border trade today, um, it's largely paper-based. Uh, one shipment can involve you know, many parties across different sectors, many exchanges of information, uh, many siloed systems, and this is very inefficient and costly. At the same time, when you have manual handling, it can be vulnerable to fraud. I can take the same document and uh, use it to take out two different loans from two different banks who are none the wiser. So, um, Treat Trust um, is a framework to accelerate this transaction, uh, this this transformation and we look, we look at it in two ways so for trade we have verifiable documents um, so these are perhaps things like an invoice or a certificate of origin that tells me okay you know this shipment comes from this country is eligible for certain preferential tariffs for example the second is um, to find a way to allow electronic bills of lading to be transferred between parties uh, along the supply chain so a bit of background, what is a bill of lading? In um, trade financing and international trade, the bill of lading acts as a receipt of goods. Uh, and um, anyone in uh, possession of this bill of lading can uh, claim the goods at the destination port. So for example, um, in this case, if I'm trying to sell something to someone in a different country, I might enlist a carrier or a ship to help me transport it to them. The carrier will issue me a bill of lading. Um, I will then courier this bill of lading to the buyer. Um, and the buyer can produce this bill of lading at the destination port to claim the shipment. But So this is a, really a very simplified version of how this flow works um, in, in international trade and trade financing. Um, but sometimes it's not as smooth because you can imagine sometimes the bill of lading will go through multiple parties who are financing this trade. So it's even possible that by the time the cargo arrives at the destination port, the bill of lading is still being couriered around the world um, and the cargo is just sitting in a port waiting to be released. Um, so I think that's where we see a lot of potential um, for electronic uh, bills of lading because the transactions can be conducted on a chain, it can be really fast um, and, and instant. So what we do in Trade, in trade Trust um, is that we represent the bill of lading as a non-fungible token. Um, we bind the NFT to um, a what we call a title escrow smart contract, uh, which then controls changes to the ownership of the token, as well as who is allowed to change the ownership status of the token. Um, and this uh, setup mimics um, the current process um, for paper-based documents in terms of who is allowed to change the, the holder and the owner of the bill of lading. Yep, so um, I hope I've given a brief overview of how open attestation works. Um, what are some of the use cases that we have um, applied it to currently? And um, here's how you can get started with open attestation. Um, can learn more about our framework over here. 
um, and um, you know, please come to our um, uh, GitHub and explore our code. Um, feel free to go, like open issues with us and talk to us. And I'm uh, really happy to um, take questions and to um, yeah, and to figure out what other use cases um, we can have um, for this technology. So, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Kelly. Ben. Thank you. Great, great project here. I love it. Um, question on the bill of lading uh, example we just gave. So the bill itself is is put uh, um, is issued as an NFT and it's verified using the open as, uh, attestation smart contracts, right? So mm -hmm. two two contracts involved in this use case. Um. I, um, it's not verified with the open attestation smart contract, uh, but it is uh, verified with the open attestation signature and proof method. Right, so um, I guess it's it's the it uses the same um, cryptography that takes the document and uh, digests it into a target hash, um, and then we're using um, the NFT um, to deal with the transactions. And, and um, regarding the use cases you mentioned, uh, which chain are they using? Which EVM chain? Uh, are any of them actually using Ethereum? As, as that's quite costly. Just wondering if any of them have uh, adopted a side chain or L2. Yeah. Um, so um, for our users, they're using Ethereum um, as well as Polygon. I had a question on the rationale for the use of a blockchain in the first place. Um, given that, the, at least for the examples you gave, the person relying on the credential, the employer or whatever it is who's trying to evaluate the validity of the credential, is relying on both the signer having a working revocation function. If, if there's no working revocation function, then there's no way to know whether fraudulent certificates have been issued and not, not cancelled. Mm -hmm. So the organization has to exist. It has to have a working revocation function. And further, that you're using the DNS to deliver the, uh, the authenticator, the, the public key that's used to validate the signature. That's a real-time service dependency. So technical service has to be working in real time. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what value there is in using a blockchain at all mm -hmm. versus a more conventional web service. Because you, you, there must be an organization, it must be responsible, and it must have real-time services available, otherwise your mechanism won't work. Mm -hmm. So what, what's, what have you gained by using a blockchain at all? Um, okay, um, going to your first question was on there being um, a way for the issuer, the signer, to hash the document. Right, and this should be. Um, well, well I, let me sort of make the, the counterpoint. If you rely upon the organization having the ability to revoke, then I, I would suggest that a blockchain is useless. If you rely on the organization presenting a service that's available to you in real time, mm -hmm. then a blockchain is useless. Blockchains are only useful, I would suggest, if both of those things are false. In this case, both of them are true. Mm -hmm. If you, if I don't, if there's. Why would I use a blockchain? Why wouldn't I just ask your web server to tell me that this certificate is or isn't valid? Yeah. Um, a few things. I think when it came to when it came to this situation of, for example, if you're looking at academic um, college certifications, um, I think what ended up being case was that verifiers would want to go to, say, the Ministry of Education um, and ask them to um, verify, for example, these um, documents. And that um, was assessed to take quite a lot of manpower, uh, a lot of efforts. Um, so the idea of this was, is there a way to... So I, I understand why... Sorry, we should probably take this offline. I understand why take away the human process. Mm -hmm. I'm asking why use a blockchain. Mm -hmm. It seems to me it would be simpler and more reliable to use a web service to all that, because there's no, the, 
the same. It's DNS. You've got a real-time service. If it's down, you're out. Yeah, um, and I think um, uh, I think we acknowledge that I think DNS is probably not the best way to yes, look at the issuance and. All, all possible, I would argue that all possible things are still There's no way to escape this. Anyway, this is a top line discussion. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, one more from Harish up there. Gonna make me go up the stairs. So thank you. <laughs> this guy. Next time. Sit down there. Huh? <laughs> I got a question about how do you, when you have the cert uh, issued by an institution, what if the institution merges with something else? How do you ensure that these things are sustainable, you know, 100 years from today? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is the mechanism for something like that? I mean, including the DNS portion, right? I mean, where, where there's a lot of dependency that requires that this entity exists, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a way for me. Where it's a piece of paper, it's a piece of paper, yeah, I mean, I can fake it, but yeah, it's still a piece of paper. So I hear, th this is something which I've been struggling with, trying, trying to find out how does this even make sense from a sustainability perspective. Thanks. So I would say that in the situation where maybe the institution merges or maybe they move to a different domain, um, I mean, the document store, um, so the smart contract on the blockchain would remain, um, and it might just be a matter of linking that document store um, to the new domain, for example. Um, so that's, um, I think, maybe one way to address that. Yeah. Um, also, I suppose if, for example, you have uh, institutions merging, um, I don't think that would invalidate the, or it should not invalidate any certificates that were issued by the old entity. And operationally, they may not want to reissue the certs under the new name because it was issued at a time when that institution was um, a different entity. So um, I guess with the immutability of the blockchain, um, that's one way to ensure that even after the entity um, has maybe closed down or moved on, um, the records would still be there. Um, although, admittedly, we would need to find a different way of tying the issue identity to the document store on the on the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah, just to add on to the answer to his questions, like if you guys ever in the early days of doing cryptography, if you guys ever went to signing parties and X509 certificates and dealt with all the complexities of that compared with the ubiquity that Ethereum and these things offer today. It's just, it's just night and day different from a practical basis. From a theoretical basis, yes, it's not perfect. It doesn't do everything. But from a practical perspective, it's just so much easier to use. And it's just common how everyone is used to using it. Uh, my question was, so I, saw, I, I was kind of surprised that, you know, I thought we were describing that this was just a protocol. But in fact, you guys have actually developed and released software. Uh, what is the scope of that software? Like if I'm an organization and I want to be able to do verification of my own documents and stuff. Is, is that what this is on? Is that what uh, this is going to provide? Well, so I guess what I would call these are uh, reference, implement, reference implementations. Um, and we also do um, release the code for that as well. So for example, for trade trust, um, .io, the verifier is um, open source. And um, implementers can refer to that to spin up their own verifiers um, and to use our um, CLI to um, help users to issue documents. Yeah, so this underlying framework, um, it's also the applications that we have built on top of that. And to the best extent possible, we do try and make it open source. This is very forward thinking stuff for you guys in Singapore. So I hope it catches on. Outstanding. All right, we got more questions there. Um, so I was curious when you did your research on how to implement this. If blockchain was a winner, which was number two option that you rejected? I, okay, so I think the two, um, well, one question that we do get asked is, um, why not just use DocuSign or a similar, you know, say like signing a PKI-based um, digital signature 
that you can um, is, you know, easily open up a PDF, and you can also have that sort of um, I suppose verification that hasn't been tampered with and that was issued by a certain entity. I think the two um, benefits of open annotation would be in terms of revocation, um, it's a lot easier to revoke um, as opposed to trying to revoke a, a, the signature of a digital document that you've already signed a PDF and sent out. Um, and the second one, which um, I think has a lot of potential, maybe hasn't been realized yet, is that, um, I mean, the, the open attestation files is, uh, is in JSON format. Um, I think it's more machine readable as opposed to like a PDF, um, a DocuSign PDF, for example, that is uh, maybe harder to integrate with systems. So I guess that was one of the other options um, that, that we considered um, and eventually decided not to go uh, ahead with. Yeah. Right. Uh, hey. Um, Hi. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't only have a question. I just want to add a bit of color uh, to uh, this great presentation. And I actually happen to work with uh, with the uh, protocol uh, a bit because I was uh, working on a on a uh, software that actually utilizes this it's called Next ID, and it utilizes this is actually really really great. And also, I just want to add a bit to uh, Roland's question just now on that uh, there's no need for blockchain, which I actually agree in this case because it's basically just uh, it, everything's just a Merkle tree. So you need to it just ties into the Merkle root because all the certs are actually not published on chain. It's just every cert has a hash, just hash it that, and then you just build that tree, and then you just have the root that you refer to somewhere. So you can see that on the DNS, or you can actually see that on the uh, on the blockchain itself. But uh, uh, blockchain itself is actually not used in this case, but there's one fundamental of blockchain that's actually adding some value here, which is the, um, the uh, immutability part. So uh, it, it helps when a cert is, um, let's say that that seed is changed someday through DNS and you cannot see that it is changed. So the blockchain part actually adds that that seed or that the root is changed. You can actually see that it is changed. So everything else is just, uh, it's just cryptography, just PKI. So there's no need for blockchain or smart contracts, but that blockchain part uh, actually helps to make sure that it, it is unchanged and you can actually track that it is changed or it's being added and, and all that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, just something I want to add there. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. And I think with that, uh, we close our session today. Thank you very much, Kali. I will give you a round of applause. Thanks for taking the, the time. Yeah, and thank you very And I think just responding to um, what uh, Yuzi mentioned, I think we don't see this as a pure blockchain thing. I think it's more, it's wider than that. Um, it's really looking at verifiable credentials. Um, and that's not something that is necessarily tied strictly to blockchain. Um, and I think we're also interested in seeing um, perhaps what are the different links and between the different ecosystems now. <laughs>